Here is our third lesson in our electronic structure of atoms chapter called line spectra and the Bohr model. Emission spectroscopy, but a flame testing review. In our previous lessons, we talked about the work of Max Planck and Albert Einstein and how they paved the way for understanding how electrons are arranged in atoms. Now in 1913 we have a Danish physicist named Niles Bohr. He offered a theoretical explanation of what the term line spectra, another phenomenon that had puzzled scientists in the 19th century. Black body radiation number one, photoelectric effect number two, and line spectra, the third phenomenon that the wave theory of light could not explain. By thinking of light and electrons in terms of both waves and as particles, we begin to lay the foundation of what's called the quantum mechanical theory. Let's first examine in this phenomenon and consider how Niles Bohr used these ideas along with Albert Einstein's and Max Planck's to become and give the foundation of what's called our current model, the quantum mechanical model. So the Danish physicist of Niles Bohr giving us what we refer to as the solar system model of our atom. We know that when radiation such as from a light source, uh, an incandescent bulb or from the sun or a star is hit with the prism, it spreads to give us a complete rainbow. A line spectrum does not do that. Niles Bohr is trying very desperately using a lot of quantum mechanical math to come up with a system of how electrons are arranged and is an explanation of these lines on the spectrum of uh, color of different wavelengths versus a continuous wavelength as our Roy G. Biv rainbow gives. So he is the first contributor to what's known as the quantum mechanical model and he did so by studying the line spectrum of hydrogen atoms. He said an atom was like a solar system, and this really is the elementary school uh, familiar model where we have a nucleus with positive protons and neutral neutrons inside of the uh, nucleus, a very small but very dense central core of an atom. And he proposed that electrons reside in specific energy levels, with the first energy level can hold up to a maximum of two electrons. In the second energy level, electrons can reside here up to a maximum of eight. In the third energy level, we can have eight and so forth. So very specific rings of energy in which electrons reside. And because these electrons are moving so fast around this dense populated area here of the nucleus, they didn't fall into the nucleus because of their velocity. They're moving around. Remember, electrons are negative and we have these positive protons. If those electrons were still, these opposite charges would be very much attracted and they would collapse. Those electrons would collapse into the nucleus. But the velocity is so magnificent compared to the, uh, the charge it's able to overcome and stay in that specific orbit. This Bohr ring atom, the solar system model of the atom, he didn't understand completely why only certain energies were allowed. He just observed that they were. And that's really what the line spectrum was showing him. Only very specific wavelengths were being shown in the spectrum. And those very specific wavelengths allowed him to determine that these energy le levels are what he determined to be the rings around the nucleus. Now it's a little more complex as the math developed and we understand that there are S-shaped clouds and P-shaped clouds and D-shaped clouds, but as a first step this was a, a, a tremendous contribution to the understanding of electrons arranged around the nucleus. So putting energy into the atom moved electrons away, moving them from ground state to the excited state. So if we consider what ground state and excited state mean and how energy is related to them, let's consider, again, the light being given off at a certain energy, which really is telling us the wavelength of the light to determine what color we see in our line spectrum. If the Bohr model gives us a solar system view 
n equal 1, that first energy level, we would call that in a hydrogen atom, remember hydrogen, mass number of 1, atomic number of 1, simply consists of a single proton and a single electron. In the nucleus is a proton. In the first energy level, we have a single electron. Bohr, when he studied the line spectrum and his theory of the solar system rings, he was using hydrogen, the simplest atom of all. In the ground state for hydrogen, the valence electron would be at a level of 1, ground state n equal 1. The first energy level has one electron. If we could get this electron to absorb energy, it did so in discrete quantities. It would absorb a certain amount of energy, as in our staircase analogy from a previous lesson. A packet of energy would force it to go from n equal 1 to n equal 2. If it absorbed two packets of energy, it would go from n equal 1 to n equal 3, or perhaps out to the fourth energy level, and so forth. But never would the electron stop halfway in between, very analogous to the stairway of the quantum mechanical model. When an electron absorbs energy, absorbing energy makes it jump out to a higher energy level. For instance, to go from n equal 1 to n equal 2, it absorbs energy to move out, away from the nucleus. Remember, the nucleus is pulling it in. Positive and negatives attract. It takes energy to force that electron to jump out. It takes even a second greater amount of energy to jump out two rings, a third amount of greater energy to go out three rings, and so forth. To absorb energy is to make the electron jump out to an outer ring. It goes from the ground state to the excited state by absorbing. We understand that in nature, things tend to be at the lowest energy level possible. So if I have an energy or an electron out at an outer ring in the excited state, it's unstable. When that electron falls back to the ground state from n equal, this would be 3 at this point, back to n equals 1, it emits energy. Perhaps you like the word releases energy, lets go of the excess energy. To jump out takes energy, to fall back releases the energy. From a ground state to an excited state absorbs. To go from the excited back to the ground, it releases. When it releases that quantized energy packets, it does so at a very specific wavelength that just happens to fall in the visible spectrum. The visible spectrum of wavelengths, Roy G. Biv, yellow, indigo, blues, violets. That wavelength is very specific. Now remember, a continuous spectrum, a continuous spectrum would be analogous to the ramp, where all of the frequencies would be present. This line spectrum is analogous to a staircase where energy is quantized and only very specific wavelengths are present. Energy level 1, energy level 2, energy level 3, and so forth. So not all of the colors appeared. By looking at line spectrum and understanding that energy is quantized and that electrons actually behave as energy, even though they're packets of matter, they behave as energy, little photons of light. And we come up with the idea of why the line spectrum is observed. If an electron could reside anywhere outside, in a continuous motion, anywhere at all, we'd see a continuous spectrum. But because electrons are held specifically to, to energy levels or rings, they give very specific lines in our spectrum. Let's try this. Give it some thought. Suppose we have a hydrogen atom. So here's this little nucleus. Energy level 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7. We understand the ground state. 
would have that valence electron in the first energy level. That's its natural place to be, the closest energy level for hydrogen, one electron in the first energy level. Let's suppose we start at energy level 3 and make it jump all the way out to energy level 7. Will it absorb or emit energy to do this? Well, obviously it needs energy to jump away from the nucleus. The further it jumps away, the more energy it requires. This is going to absorb energy. Going from a lower to a higher energy level absorbs necessary energy to make the electron jump. So this line spectra, we understand that if a radiant source of energy is monochromatic, it is releasing a single wavelength. A laser does this, light amplitude simulation emission radiation. This is an acronym. A laser is monochromatic. A laser releases a single wavelength of energy. However, we understand also that that's not common. In nature, the most natural uh, radiation sources like light bulbs, stars, the sun, anything producing radiation contains many different wavelengths and it gives us what we call that continuous spectrum. The spectrum that's produced can either be a continuous spectrum where we have all the wavelengths present from reds, orange, yellows, greens, blues, indigos, and violets. Roy G. Biv is a continuous spectrum. A line spectrum has only specific wavelengths present. The black separation is the absence of that particular energy. If we were to take a prism and spread light from a light bulb, you would produce a continuous spectrum. The entire rainbow would be present. We see this anytime we see a, a rainbow outside. If it's raining and the sun happens to hit the raindrops just right, or if it's misting, we can see the sunlight separated into the complete prism. The line spectrum is not like that. Not all radiation produces a continuous spectrum. Elements do not. When elements, which are made of atoms, absorb energy or release energy, they do so in quantized amount, very specific discrete packets of energy. When neon gas is placed under pressure in a tube, we see a very familiar red-orangish glow. We, we're familiar with the term neon signs. Although any of those natural uh, neon signs from the noble gases produce a variety of colors, neon happens to be, I think, just kind of the, the common name for any of the colors we're seeing. If you burn argon, krypton, xenon, any of those noble gases, you get a different color. Neon happens to burn the reddish orange. When we see light coming from such tubes that are passing through a prism, we only have a few wavelengths present. And when a few wavelengths are present, we get lines on our spectrum separated by the black regions. And the lines, instead of a complete rainbow, are due to very specific energies that are present. For instance, sodium, if we were to take sodium atom and make it absorb energy to make it go from the ground state to the excited state, then let it release it. Absorption versus emission spectroscopy. It absorbs wavelength, it absorbs energy, you don't see anything in terms of color. It's when it releases the energy that it emits so that our, our eye can detect the wavelength. Now notice that what sodium actually burns is kind of a yellow in our flame testing. The wavelengths that are absorbed and released happen to fall in the yellow range. Notice what it's absorbing appears here and that's the same missing in the emission spectroscopy. So the two lines that appear here are missing here absorption, emission. To our eye, if we were to conduct a flame test for sodium, we would see yellow. Here are some others. When we look at lithium, there are line spectrums. Now remember when we burn lithium, we happen to see the red. It's going into the first excited state. 
sodium in the yellow. Potassium actually burns more of a violet. Rubidium has a flare of red, and so forth. You can see the lines with the greater number of electrons as the atoms become more plex and we have more electrons absorbing energy, more electrons are going to give us more lines on the spectrum. And that reminds us of the lab we conducted in our first year chemistry. Perhaps you've done this test with me. Flame testing. We were given a series of metals and we burned them in a flame. And what we were trying to do is just simply record the color we observed. When you take a sample and run it up and down in the Bunsen burner side, you get a flare of color. Because every atom is unique in the number of electrons and how they arrange those electrons, they have very specific wavelengths assigned to them, very specific wavelengths that just happen to fall into the spectrum of the continuous visible range. Selenium's green, copper more of a blue-green, barium a lighter green, strontium a brick red, potassium violet. And I think probably the most difficult to see is the bright yellow of sodium because it tends to be masked with the orange flame. Let's introduce what we call the Rydberg equation. When scientists first detected the line spectrum in hydrogen, this was mid-1800s, they were fascinated by its simplicity. And at that time, only four lines in the visible portion of the spectrum were ever observed. The others were lying outside the visible spectrum. It was in 1885, we had a Swiss schoolteacher named Johann Balmer show that these wavelengths of the four visible lines of hydrogen fit into what we call the ultraviolet and infrared regions of hydrogen. Maybe you've heard of the Balmer series in your studies in physical science. Soon Balmer's equation was extended to a more general one called the Rydberg equation. And this equation allows us to calculate the wavelength of any of the observed spectral lines. We need to record this equation. It's very important. This is the reciprocal of the wavelength, 1 over the wavelength, remember that this is in meters, is equal to Rydberg's constant, and we will talk about that on the next slide. Rydberg's constant, again a calculated value, will come to us in what's called a per meter, times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. Now what are these? The n's are energy levels. The energy level number 1 is smaller than the energy level number 2. n1 is always smaller than n2. And if I remember it this way, it's going to help me in determining if, a, if a energy is going to be emitted or absorbed. So in other words, if this is little nucleus, n equal 1, first energy level, n equal 2, second energy level, n equal 3, third energy level, and so forth. When I plug the numbers into Rydberg's equation, I always do the subtraction with the smaller number than the larger number. The squaring of that is part of the mathematics. One over lambda is set equal to Rydberg's constant times, and notice the parenthesis, the reciprocal of the difference between n1 squared and n2 squared. Lambda is the wavelength of the spectral line. Lambda is measured in a meter. Lambda is the wavelength. It's the upside down Y in the Greek alphabet. RH is called the Rydberg constant. 1.096776 times 10 to the 7th per meters. I use 1.10 times 10 to the 7th per meter for the Rydberg constant. N is the energy level that we're calculating for. Now we had a 
separate slide or a separate uh, equation page where we had, and perhaps you still have yours out from the previous lesson, we had started generating equations and constants that we had to remember for our chapter. The first equation came from lesson one, C equal lambda nu, where C is the speed of light, 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meter per second. Speed of light constant. In lesson two, we introduced the idea of calculating energy using Planck's constant. Energy measured in joules is equal to Planck's constant times the frequency of our energy. Planck's constant was 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times second. Here is Rydberg's equation, a third to add. We can calculate the wavelength of any line in our line spectrum by using Rydberg's constant times the first energy level squared reciprocal minus the second energy level squared reciprocal. The difference here times Rydberg's constant is equal to the reciprocal of our wavelength. We need to work at memorizing Rydberg's constant. 1.10 there, 1.10, I'll make that neater, sorry, 1.10 times 10 to the seventh per meters. So add that to your equation page. Alrighty, so coming back here is looking at Rydberg equation, adding that on to our equation page. So just to clarify, I'm emphasizing the following vocabulary. Bohr model talks about energy levels, the solar system model. Energy levels are rings around the nucleus. The ring that is closest to the nucleus is called N equal one. It can hold up to two electrons hydrogen helium end of row one. The next energy level outside of n equal one is n equal two and so forth. N represents the energy level by counting the rings as we head away from the nucleus. The ground state when the electron is found in its lowest energy level and if it gains energy it pops out to an excited state jumping to an outer energy level is called excited. To go from ground to excited absorbs energy. To fall back it releases energy. Let's predict which one of the following electronic transitions produces the spectral lines having the longest wavelength the longest wavelength. I can calculate the wavelength by using Rydberg's equation. The reciprocal of the wavelength is found by taking the Rydberg's constant times 1 over n1 squared minus 1 over n2 squared. n1 is always the smaller number. Alrighty, so let's go to work. We have some uh, setup to do. First bullet, the reciprocal of the, of the wavelength of the lambda there is Rydberg's constant, 1.0, oh, I get that wrong, 1.10, 1.10 times 10 to the seventh per meters, one over, let's see the smallest number is one squared minus one over two squared. Now let's hit this and see what the algebra will do for us. I always start inside the parentheses first. Parenthesis, one divided by one squared, you know what that will give you, right? One minus parenthesis, one divided by two squared. Did you find a value of 0.75 for inside the parenthesis? The key sequence you might consider hitting, 
parenthesis, 1 over 1 squared minus parenthesis, 1 over 2 squared, close that other parenthesis, and then hit 1.1 .1 times 10 to the, to the seventh power. Make this your key sequence on your calculator, and let's hit that for a common answer. So first step as I just get used to hitting double parenthesis. 1 divided by 1 squared, close the first parenthesis, minus, open the next set of parentheses, 1 divided by 2 squared, close both parentheses, times 1.1e7. We have a large number, don't we? But remember, this is the reciprocal, isn't it? 1 over lambda equals 8250000 1 over lambda equal 825 with four zeros after it. So now how do we isolate the lambda? Well, it ends up to just switch positions. 1 divided by 8250000 will give us our lambda. So now on my calculator, I just go 1 divided by that previous answer, and we come up with the meters. Did you find the same thing as I did? 1.21 times 10 to the negative 7th meters. You might see that reported in a more common unit, nanometer. There's the first one. Here we have, we're asked to calculate, and we'll get faster. This is 121 nanometers. Alrighty. Let's do from energy level 3 to 2. So I'll, again, here's the second part. We're going to calculate lambda by setting it equal to Rydberg's constant, 1.10 times 10 to the 7th per meters, times, we're going from energy level 3 to 2. So the smallest one is 2, isn't it? Smallest one first. 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 3 squared. Now what would the calculator sequence look like? Let's get this common answer. Just start by hitting 1 over 1, oops, sorry, 1.1 1 .1 E7 times, and I just use double parentheses. Let me write this out for you. Here's my key sequence. 1.1 1 .1 E7 double parentheses, 1 over 2 squared minus 1 over 3 squared, close that double parentheses. That's my key sequence that I'm hitting right now. Try that and make sure you're getting the same thing. One over three squared. Close both parentheses. The reciprocal of lambda is a large number. One, five, two, seven, 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 seven. And I got this repeating seven here. That's not our answer. We want lambda. So we have to take one over. You do not need to show all this work. I'm just trying to show key sequence. One divided by that previous answer. And here is 6.55 times 10 to the negative 7th meters, which is 655 nanometers. I'm seeing a trend. The wavelength is getting longer as I'm jumping out further. So let's calculate just to show ourselves that. n equal 4 to n equal 3. I'll just do that right here. 1 over lambda is equal to Rydberg's constant, 1.1 1 .1 times 10 to the 7th per meters, times 1 over, use the smallest number first, 3 squared minus 1 over 4 squared, close your parentheses. Hit that with me, see what we find. 1.1 1 .1 e7 times double parenthesis, 1 divided by 3 squared, close that, minus, open a new parenthesis, 1 over 4 squared, close both parentheses, large number, 
1 divided by that answer and we get our wavelength and here we have 1.87 times 10 to the negative 6 which actually 1870 nanometers quite significantly larger than 655 1870 nanometers whatever unit you prefer but we definitely see the longest wavelength coming from those outermost energy levels but this was good practice with Rydenberg's constant trying to get that familiar algebra going on I just again like to use little parentheses tricks here indicate whether each of the following electronic transitions emit energy or does it require absorption does it require or does it so absorb or release really is all we have to say if energy level 3 jumping back to 1 n falling back to 1 n from 3 falling back to 1 that's going to release energy our text calls that emitting energy going from number 2 out to number 4 that requires energy it will absorb energy falling back climbing ahead that easy For each of the following transition states, we have quite a bit of work here. We have to calculate the energy. The frequency and the wavelength. And determine whether the radiation is emitted or absorbed during each of the transitions. This uses all three equations. Energy uses Planck's constant. To interchange wavelength and frequency, we use the speed of light. And of course, looking at energy levels, we use the Rydberg equation. Taking the difference of energy level 1 squared from the energy level 2 squared and using that to calculate wavelengths. We have three different equations that are going to be employed for each of these parts. So, from n equal 4 to n equal 1, right off the bat, I know that this is going to release energy. And to release energy, that's going to tell me that it's exothermic. That energy, if it's releasing, needs to be a negative value. If it's absorbing, it will be a positive value, endo versus exo. So I'm just kind of considering the the magnitude is it going to be positive or negative, re, uh, you know, releasing or absorbing when I report out my joules of energy. So falling from 4 back to 1 is releasing. Same for this one. The energy here will be released. From climbing 3 out to number 6, that's absorbing. So what I know here is this will be negative joules of energy, negative joules of energy, but this one will absorb, so I'll have positive joules of energy. Just numerically, I want to make sure my sign represents my understanding of exo versus endothermic, absorbing versus releasing. Let's take a look at that first bullet there. From n equal 4 to n equal 1, we have to pull out wavelength first to get to frequency. From frequency, we can pull out energy. We use our Rydberg's equation, 1.10 times 10 to the 7th per meter. Between n equal 4 and n equal 1, the smaller of the two comes first. 1 squared minus the reciprocal of 4 squared. Let's calculate wavelength. 1.1 e to the 7th times double parenthesis. 1 divided by 1 squared, close your parenthesis, subtract, new parenthesis is opened, 1 divided by 4 squared, 2 sets of parentheses to close everything, we get a number, that number is large, does your screen say 103, 12500, it's not my answer, that's the reciprocal, I have to hit 1 divided by the answer, and now I find this is my wavelength, 9.6969 and so forth. So let's call that 9.70 times 10 to the negative 8 meters. There's my wavelength. 
Let's find the frequency. C equal lambda nu. I know C because it's a constant. 3.0, let me record this as my first. 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second is equal to the wavelength expressed in meters times the frequency. Pull out frequency. Use the speed of light to convert your wavelength into frequency. So 3E8 divided by my previous answer there on my screen. And my frequency of this radiation is 3.093, so 3.09 times 10 to the 15th per seconds. We also need to know energy. Energy uses Planck's constant. Planck's constant is 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joules per second. Frequency was just calculated, 3.09 times 10 to the 15th per second. Pull out joules of energy. So my previous answer is still on the screen. Times 6.63 E negative 34, which is Planck's constant, and the energy of 2.05 times 10 to the negative 18th joules. Remember what we said, though? This was releasing energy, the energy coming out from the system. Make sure you see that it's negative. Energy is released. First one, <laughs> we did three equations. We solved first using Rydberg's equation to find wavelength. From wavelength, we pulled out frequency. And from frequency, we found joules of energy. Try the algebra for the second one. You may certainly pause this video. Let's calculate for all three variables, wavelength, frequency, and energy. If the electron falls from five, back to energy level two. Work ahead of me. Pause the video. Work ahead. See if we're getting the same answers. One over the wavelength is equal to Rydberg's constant, 1.10 times 10 to the seventh power per meter. Smaller of our numbers is energy level two, the reciprocal of two squared minus the reciprocal of five squared. Pull out the wavelength, 1.10 e to the seventh power times, I put in two sets of parentheses, one divided by two squared, close one parenthesis, minus, open a new parenthesis, one divided by five squared, close both parentheses, and you get two, three, one, zero, 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 not our answer, that's the reciprocal of our answer. So now I hit one divided by my previous answer, and here's my wavelength. 4.33 times 10 to the negative seventh meters. Keep in mind that's 433 nanometers. But I'll leave it in meters because that's what I need when I convert this and pull out the frequency. The speed of light is then used, 3.0 times 10 to the eighth meters per second, to convert this wavelength into a frequency. Frequency will come to us in a per second. 3E8 divided by the answer on my screen. And this frequency is reported as 6.93 times 10 to the 14th hertz, which is per second. Third variable asked for is energy. Energy uses Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34th joules times second, times our calculated frequency, and we'll have energy. 
So I still have my frequency on my calculator screen, so I just simply hit times 6.63 E negative 34. And energy in joules is reported as 4.59 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. Remember, we said it was being released. Dropping back releases energy. So let's make sure we denote that with a negative to remember that it's releasing the energy. There was one more in our note pack, wasn't it? We had to go from n equal 3 to n equal 6, absorbing energy. We're getting pretty fast at these now, I bet. 1 over the wavelength is equal to Rydenberg's constant, 1.10 times 10 to the 7th per meters times, remember to use the first number as the smallest one, the reciprocal of 3 squared minus, I have that backwards, minus the reciprocal of 6 squared. This will give us the reciprocal of lambda, so I take 1 divided by this answer. So let's hit this out, 1.1e to the 7th power times, I open two parentheses, 1 divided by 3 squared, close one set, minus, open a new parenthesis, 1 over 6 squared, close both parentheses, very large number, 91666 repeating. So 1 divided by that answer, and here's my wavelength, 1.09 times 10 to the negative 6th power, and wavelengths report in meters. This is a stray little line there. I know that this is positive, yeah, all right, so positive meters, that I was going to say energy is going to be positive, it was absorbing, but I'm not there yet. So here's the meters. Wavelength measured in meters. Let's pull out frequency by using our speed of light constant, 3 times 10 to the 8th meters per second, set equal to 1.09 times 10 to the negative 6 meters, pull out frequency, and this will come in up per second. 3e8 divided by that answer still on my calculator, in this frequency, 2.75 times 10 to the 14th per second. Now we can find energy. Energy will be positive. It's absorbing energy. Use Planck's constant, 6.63 times 10 to the negative 34 joules times second, times our calculated frequency from our previous slide, and here it is. On my screen is still the frequency on my calculator, so I hit times 6.63 E, negative 34, and my joules of energy reported as positive for absorbing 1.82 times 10 to the negative 19th joules. What a great problem that incorporates all three of our learned equations so far. First one came from lesson one, C equal lambda nu. Here is our lesson number two, and now in Lesson 3, Rydberg's Equation. Looking at line spectrum and being able to calculate the wavelength of the observed colors from a flame test. We've just concluded Lesson 3. Stop your lessons here. Work on your assignment. Lesson 3 and Lesson 4 actually go together, so you're going to complete the next lecture before you actually can complete the assignment, but you certainly have enough ammunition to get started with the first few problems. Same is true for the multiple choice quiz. Lesson 3 and 4 have uh, a combined quiz as well. So good work today.